hey, welcome back. Where we're going to pick up uh, is with the flavor of the month story. And if you'll look at on page seven in your handout. Now, what we want to do is also remember all the stuff that we just covered here when we talked about the barrier of uh, lack of a formalized training program. Now, we're also moving in. After we get through with this, we're going to be looking at some change. Uh, we're going to cover that. And so we want you to start putting all this stuff together in regards to the four barriers and how they're interacting uh, with your organization and also how they're going to affect and change. So if you look at the flavor of the month story, it says we're going to do quality this month. It's interesting as we get in, we have a tendency to do whatever that hot program of the month is. In fact, next month it might be communication. Month before it was quality. So if you look at it, we have a tendency to do what, what is termed out there on the market flavor of the month. And it's at really, it's not like we're going after it to, uh, it, it, with an intent to do anything wrong. The, the issue is, is that that's what the training educational industry has been giving us. So what we're saying here is that looking at the flavor of the month, when we're doing that, it promotes distrust internally within the organization because what happens is we get this new training coming down the pike. We didn't follow through with the last one. It never went anywhere. And if I did get involved and step up, I got the tar whipped out of me somewhere. So if you look at it, promotes distrust internally within the organization because the organization is continually switching directions. And we're saying we need to stick with the basics or the basis of an organization and its training. Now, we talked about that. What do we mean by the base or the base or the foundation of the training? We're saying here that we need to stick with our base training in regards to not only base work centers, but uh, base skills and base work center work. Believe, it, believe me, it's not, going to be, it's not going to happen without the base work center consistency and accountability. We're saying here that the flavor of the month under this story, we really have to develop our base work centers to create that accountability internally within the organization. And any training program that we're going to do or build the strength of the organization has to be done by developing those base work centers and those skills to develop those base work centers. The company must support this training, uh, th its training department, encourage it to develop a long-term training program and stick with it. Again, when things get weird in an organization, like most of us sometimes have problems, uh, is that we just start throwing away the training program. We're saying it, we get started, because remember the other day we talked about consistency promotes truth that promotes trust. So what we're saying here again is that we got to get started, and whatever it is we get started with, we got to stick with the bases and we have to stick with it. And it says the uh, life lesson, look out for new packaging of old concepts with new substance. Man, it's amazing how we take what's out there, repackage it, reformat it, got a new twist or a new spin to it, and now that's the hot issue that's out there. We're saying here the hot issues are the issues that are, that are in a concern and that will never go out of vogue, if you want to say it, is going to be focusing on our people and our process. Because we want you to come out of this with an understanding that if you're not working on our people and our process, uh, you're not going to go anywhere long term with your training or with the infrastructure of that organization. And all I all our do is our, our expenses will, will get out of line and there's no way to correct them. If you look at budget 2 to 6 percent of payroll, this is what we're talking about here in the uh, how to figure out what we need to budget for training. Even though we talked about this before, we really need to think about and follow through on this training of this 2 to 6 percent of budgeting that is a good starting point. Long-term planning will instill required discipline into most organizations training and uh, plan process. What we're looking at here is that we have to long-term plan, we have to have a curriculum, we have to agree to it, we have to plan it, we have to schedule it, and we have to manage and monitor it. So if you look at what we're talking about here, long term, we have to do these things internally to make it happen. And it has to take a long term commitment and planning. We, because in effect, that's going to start discipline. And discipline, you remember we talked about affirmation. Affirmation is, is that we have to keep doing it until it becomes a habit. And it takes eight or nine months. So if you look at it, this will start discipline if you'll watch 
will start disciplining one hour every other week that you will find that people will have to start budgeting their time or planning an hour before and an hour after. And then everyone else is going to start planning around that. But if you look at it, the majority of our work day is kind of a hit and a miss, addressing whatever fire comes down the road without much planning. And when we're talking about the, the training, watch out for the what ifs. You remember we talked about watch out for that 1%, that affecting 5%, that affect 20%, that's going to what if this deal to death. If you look at the 40% of the work day is wasted because of the inefficiency, what we're saying here is that statistically it's been proven that 40% of the work day is wasted. And, and as I said earlier, I really thought that number was weird. And I've actually talked to some other folks, and they believe it to be a lot higher than that. And it's not that our people aren't trying and working hard, but they're battling daily the four barriers to quality. Remember the fear, the lack of communication, the lack of written procedure, and the lack of training. Also interacting in that mix is the 1% that's manipulating everything known to civilized man in that. So what's going to happen? Not only are we looking at the, the budgeting of the time, but we're going to have to look out for that 1% that's going to manipulate everything. And we're going to have to look at, hey, there'll never be a good time. We just have to get started training. You're going to go, and I don't care how many companies that it's really weird I go into, and they go, well, we're not ready this month. Let's do it next month. Or this is our, our busy time of the year. Get me in the slow time of the year. Or get me after the Christmas, get me after the first, get me. What you're going to see is that there's never a good time to start training. There will never be a good time. You'll always be too busy. That's why we never develop the stuff, because we never get started. So in order to do it, we just have to get started. It's not going to be a good time to get started. If you look at the life lesson, it says, do not look at the training budget as an expense, but as an investment in, as an asset in your organization and for your employees. We have to move away from that mentality that the training and the training budget is, is a liability. It's an asset. And that's really a hard thing to change because we're graduating a lot of people out of school that looks at that as a line item issue. And what we're saying, that's really an easy thing for us to cut because it is a line item issue. Just cut that deal out of there and you just rose 2 to 6% to the bottom line. And watch out for that mobile management, what we're talking about, coming in and cutting expenses and dropping that stuff to the bottom line. It's really interesting. I'll give you a little Wall Street uh, secret here. You ever wonder why an organization lays off people? I'll give you a, a little clue here. If you look at an organization, they call it creating shareholder value and equity. The, there's only one line item issue you can cut today that's going to affect the bottom line tomorrow, and that's payroll. Uh, you, you're not going to be able to change much else in there. If you look at that, we cut our people, and what happens, let's just say it's a large or organization and we drop one million bucks to the bottom line over the year. If Wall Street's trading at 15 to 18 times earning, we have just made or created what they call shareholders value or equity of $18 million. That's why a lot of that stuff goes on. And it's not improving the business. We're not improving our market, not improving our customer service. But what happens in a lot of these deals, those guys that come in and cut and do, they're off and gone. And I've also seen in, uh, I was speaking in Washington, D.C. at a leadership conference out there. And they had a special on a family-owned hardware store. All of a sudden, a family-owned hardware store, they sold, went public, and then all of the sudden, they started uh, cutting the employees, cutting the inventory, turning off the lights, every other light, to, and they brought the utility cost down. And what happened was they turned around and sp spun that. Uh, within two years, they were now going bankrupt, and now they had a new person. Now they had $250 million infusion. So all of a sudden now they're sitting there and going, what we're going to do is that we're going to make sure we have inventory. We're going to make sure we have people in the aisles. We're going to make sure that we have stock. We're going to make sure the store is well lit. So everything that we took out of there, we're now having to put back in, but it's cost somebody, and it's us, $250 million bucks. So this is what we're talking about here, this line out of management and invest, investing in your people. And that's an easy way to go. So watch out with this item in regards to your training. And it says, 
Uh, we'd like to look now at what is change. And it's really kind of interesting what exactly is change. Change has become or differed or altered, transforming or converting the way that you're currently doing business. Now, we're not talking about some major stuff here. We're talking about change as far as interacting with one another. We're talking about change of problem solving. We're talking about change of defining our systems. We're talking about change of giving our employees input. We're talking about change of developing systems. We're talking about change of just saying smile in the AM. This is not major stuff, but as the organization changes, if we don't have the base skills in place, how in the world are we going to change with it? Remember, the change is fear, no matter how much or how little, and so in order we have to promote the consistency that promotes truth, that promotes trust of what we covered there in one of our other classes. Change must have unquestionable commitment, desire from leadership, the top guys in the company. This is what we're saying is, is that in the change, if we're saying this is what we want to do as an organization, the folks that are leading the company have to lead and model that change. We've had enough of that writing these grand mission and value statements and throwing them out there and our employees are going, man, that's another crock. We're having to get our people involved and there's no other important job for the leaders in the organization than its customers and its employees because without either one, you're out of business. And let's look at now another story. It's called Corporate Setting the Tone. Now, this is kind of a little involved story here, but what I'd like to do is for you to really think about what we're talking about, corporate setting the tone. And we're not really necessarily talking about, remember, earth-shattering stuff. We're talking about that the way the organization is going to change and adapt to change is that it has to have leadership because we're all waiting to see what our boss does. Believe me, if our boss isn't doing it, we're not going to do it because of the fear. And the fear is change. And I don't care what mandates are written at the top, passed down. If my immediate supervisor, it might as well have been somebody from Mars telling us how to do that. Okay, let's look at... Uh, the corporate setting the tone. Tone for change in an organization. The corporate office needs to project the culture regarding the elimination of the four barriers to quality. If you're looking at that, the four barriers to quality, we have to put that into play in order for this change to happen. And what we're talking about is that, again, the organization's leadership has to set the tone for it. It can be as simple as answering the phone. It's what's really interesting is that I can call almost any company in the country and we can usually tell by the person that's answering that phone and how they're answering that phone is what the attitude is of the owner. And that's really kind of interesting because whether you realize it or not, you can get the hacksaw guy, you can get all this other stuff that you want to. That's, uh, look at all this stuff that's gone on over these last 10 to 20 and 30 years. A lot of those guys aren't around anymore. A lot of those businesses aren't around anymore. We either spin them off, sell them, sell our stuff, and now looking at where are we at today. We got to focus on the basics. I don't care what anybody out there is saying. We have to focus on the basics. The corporate, oh, I'm sorry, they must adhere to the two rules. When we're talking about corporate setting the change, they have to adhere to the two rules. And the two rules, remember, are do what's morally and ethically correct and treat everybody as you want to be treated. And guys, we're, we're talking about that. That's about as simple as it gets. When in doubt, step back and look at that. We need, as corporate, to let's move from dictatorial style of management to the one of a, a partnership based on trust. When we're saying dictatorial, that's sending out that memo or sending in that vice president or that department head or that union guy and saying this is what we got to do and you need to do it. What we need to do is look at corporate from a position of support. How can we help you? Corporate needs to be there for support, not dictatorship because it's not going to work. We have to be in there helping our organization achieve what our goals are. We have to give them the tools. We have to give them the base values. We have to work. The whole loop starts again. How can we, how can we help you with what we've achieved? This is what we're talking about. We got to go in and help our people. It's unfair for corporate to make demands without support. It's really unfair to go, guys, 
you got to cut 5%. And there's nothing more insulting in an organization than I'm busting my whatever you want to call it, I'm busting my balloon here, and all of a sudden I'm sitting here and they're telling me to cut 5%. I worked and we've all killed ourselves, then we get the mandate down next year, cut another 5%. We can only cut so much. And if you look at it over these last 30 years, we have cut the equity out of almost every major organization out there. There's no more. Somebody goes, hey, can you believe it? There's not very many mergers or acquisitions or these uh, 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 highly leveraged deals going on anymore. Uh, I said, I guess not. We've done taken all the equity out of these companies now are running thin. And so one little hiccup and all of a sudden their stock price drops and all of a sudden now we're having to issue more stock to put back in there. We have used up the equity not only of our organizations, but we've used up the equity of our people. And if you look at that, that's where I'm talking about that line out of management. We can only cut so long. And all we've been doing for, the, it seems like, the last 10 to 20 to 30 years is cutting expenses. Learn to improve your business through developing your people and your processes that will cut your expenses. But there's nothing more disheartening to one of us down on the front line than we get some ridiculous mandate that we know there's absolutely no way that we can do it. So we have to step back and look at how we're going to improve business long term instead of that quarter to quarter mentality. We have to be honest with ourselves, we have to be honest with our organization, we have to be honest with our shareholders. So you cannot create shareholder value or equity at the expense of your people or your organization. It's unfair. Change is fear. Uh, let's look at that story. Any change in an organization brings fear. This is what we're talking about here, is that any organization brings, any change in an organization brings fear. I don't care if it's this much, this much, or whatever, change is fear. So when you come down with a new mandate, remember, it doesn't matter how big or how complicated you think it is, change is fear, mainly because we don't trust. Okay. Look at uncertainty relating to the outcome. When change is fear, we're looking at whether, what in the world is the outcome of this thing going to be? How many things have we stopped and started internally within the organization? Number one, we don't trust the organization, so we're trying to figure out what in the world and what is the outcome. Is it going to be my job? Is it be the fact that if I define it, uh, define it make it more efficient, is that all of a sudden now they're going to dump more stuff on me? If you look at it, look at what's happening out there. We, you can outsource anything known to man and somebody will always beat your price. Look at all the things that we have outsourced, including our employees. Well, that's an easy way to sit there as a line item management and cut our expenses immediately because someone will always beat your price. Well, I got that 10% reduction at what expense long term. Look at all these employment agencies that we're leasing back our uh, employees. Look at what they're having to do now. We've cut away their benefits. We've cut away their retirement. We've cut away their health plans. What are these employment agencies doing now? They're giving incentives, uh, bonuses. They're now giving health plans. They're now giving retirement plans. Look at us. We've gone to complete loop again. And we're tired of hearing our people don't want to be loyal. How can they be loyal? Think about it. Just like with that hardware story, we keep going in these loops and all of a sudden we're gone and we're wondering what happened. Stick to the basics. Instead of all this new stuff and all these new fads or crazes, I don't care what it does, it gets down to your people and process. Whether you're in a computer industry, software industry, the internet or anything. And that's a whole nother story. We can look at those boys and what's happening with them. Uncertainty, uh, I'm sorry, seems safer just to continue. What we're saying with change, it just seems safer just to keep doing what we're doing than to change. Whether, the, the, whether it's good or it's bad or the change is needed, that's why it's so important for the leadership of the organization to set the tone of change. It's easier just to keep doing what we're doing. Look at all the businesses out there that are out of business because they didn't change. Because, again, it's easier to keep doing what you're doing. Change is both mentally and emotionally. Now, this is interesting here. Change is both mentally and emotionally. We have a tendency to look at change. I told you how 
most of the time that we change is that we change and we go paint the trucks all the same color or we go reorganize. We're going to reorganize into divisions based off a of product or based off a of service or geographic or this or that. Those are tangible things. That's why we change those things or get everybody with the same uniform. Everybody have the same logo. Everybody have the same... We're not, we're, all we're doing is wiping over the top of it. We need to look at internally within the organization and help our people change and grow. Remember, the only way for continuance and growth is to build our people through in our processes. So it is both an emotional and a mental change and learn to deal with change. This is what we're talking about here with the interpersonal skills, is that the best way to learn how to deal with change is to have trust. That's, that's pretty simple, is that change is tough. Change is fear. Let's look at the biggest thing we need to do when we go into an organization is that we, that change be well thought out and communicate it, plan, direct it, and monitor. When we're talking about change, most change is ill-fated from the begin with. We've got to go in there, stir it up, and by just saying we're going to get our product out, our customer service responding in 12 hours instead of 24, that sounds awesome. Your first question in the boardroom, in the management room, in the project management room, in the strategic planning is how in the world are we going to do it? Not only that, but how are we going to manage, plan, schedule, and monitor that? Remember, we have to give the tools and the direction to, for that thing to happen. Most of the change in an organization is being crammed down our throats. Most of the employees have no input in the change, have no direction. We don't know where we're going. So what happens is we get another mandate from somebody we've never seen telling us what we got to do. And it's hard to tell somebody to change when they're working 40 to 50 to 55 hours a week and never caught up that we got to change the way to do business and do it better. Think how insulting that is. And we just about worn our people out doing that. And look at the successful companies that are out there. It's amazing. Uh, most of the companies that are out there uh, that are successful long term, example, Baker Commodities. The average tenure of their employee is something like 18 years. The, the three or four years I was there, I can't tell you how many employees we had that retired after 30 years. That's almost uncommon now. But it was, it's the integrity of that founder and Jim Sr. that's saying, hey, we're going to take care of our people. Guys, the most successful organizations out there take care of their people. And there's a lot of good companies doing a lot of good things, but we have a tendency to hear all the negative stuff out there. They will hold one another accountable for quality. They will write tougher uh, procedures. What we're saying here is that by delegating down these procedures and delegating down these base skills that our employees will define their base work centers, they'll write tougher procedures than we could ever mandate. Your employees are not going to take advantage. You've got the 1%, but by having all employees involved, they're going to hold the 1% accountable because they've been aggravating them folks for years. By tightening up these procedures and base work centers, we now are starting to hold that 1% accountable. And remember, that's the person that's going to be hollering the loudest. And they know when you go to the water cooler. They know when I can plant a seed and make it negative on any particular person or department internally in the organization that's frustrating the 99%. I want you to remember one thing, and that is focus on the 99% of your employees that are doing it right. The 1% will take care of himself, and if you watch it, the loudest at 1% we're always jumping through hoops and they've always got a problem and they're never happy. So we're wasting our time and energy on them. This, allowing these base skills and the definition of process and systems, you're going to delegate it down to where your fellow employees and co-workers are going to be able to hold them accountable. The only way change is going to happen in an organization is for the employee to feel secure in that organization and secure with that leadership. Basically, secure is without fear, meaning if we're going to change and you're sincerely wanting to change, I don't, I can't have fear of change. If I'm stepping out into uncharted area, I got to know I've got your trust. I got to know I'm not going to get the tar whipped out of me. Remember, I have to feel secure with the organization and leadership. 
let's look at now we're talking about organization, organizational change and it's on page, tw page 12. So let's look at page 12 in your handout. Now we talked about a lot of interesting things here. Now we're wanting you to look at this change. What you're going to see is that this change is going to reflect back and forth with the other four barriers. Let me refresh your memory. The four barriers are fear of expression, lack of communication, lack of written procedure, and lack of training. You can't train until you have written procedure developed by the people doing the job. You can't do that until you have open and honest communication. You can't get that until you remove the fear of base, uh, the fear of, uh, the. I'm sorry, have to remove the fear of expression or action. All right, if you look at that, all of that is built on what we call our base values and our two rules. Do what's morally and ethically correct and treat everybody as you want to be treated. That's how most of us was raised. Let's reinforce that in the workplace. No reason it can't be different. It's not that your organization is doing anything wrong or unethical, but the organization is really unsure of the organization's pos position. This is why we're saying that we have to put it in writing and live it day in and day out, and it has to come with the direction of leadership. The product of the resistance to change. Let's look at that daily battle of insecurity. Man, if you look at it, when there's change, we're in a daily battle of insecurity. Why are we changing? What's wrong? What are they going to do? Because I don't trust the organization. And it, remember, it's not necessarily what your organization's doing. It's what I'm hearing, the negative imprinting daily from the media, whether it's in television or whether it's in print, or the fact of my old job, or the fact of sack of rocks I'm carrying with me from my childhood. So if you look at it, change is fear, and we're in a daily battle of insecurity. And I tell you what, every time your employees turn on the television at home and they're hearing a company downsizing or outsourcing, believe me, that sets a chill. And when I go places, I ask everybody to raise their hand if they know someone or if they personally have been downsized or outsourced. I'm saying we're probably about 95% in that audience has either experienced it or known someone else close to them that has experienced it. And guys, that's insulting. I, I don't care what anybody says, that's insulting. I would rather us focus on these companies that are out there and for every one company you hear doing that, there's 10 to 20 other ones that are doing it the right way. The problem is we don't get it out there and we don't get it reinforced in the, in the media and on a day in and day out basis. Let's focus on our good people, the good companies that are doing it right. If you look at management and employee, we're saying does the uh, resistance to change, is it any different in management? Our employees know it's the same. It's just as tough for management to change as what it is the front line. Because in effect, what you will see is that the change will come from the, uh, the top, and then the, the top managers will move it down to the middle managers, and they're the ones that are really having to live with this thing day in and day out, and the employees are down, down there going, okay, here it comes again. So if you look at the management and the employee, it has the same amount of fear when we're in, in regards to change, so it's no different. And in fact, I think it's a little tougher with management. Because if you look at with the management, they're kind of getting it from both sides. They're getting it from the folks that they're reporting to and plus the folks that they're, they're managing. So they kind of have a tendency to get it from both sides. And it says uh, consistency of past merits. And what we're talking about here, change is tough because we've laid down a lot of inconsistencies in a lot of ways of what we said we were going to do, but we never did. So we're also, that is a big part of the lack of, uh, the lack of trust and the change then the resistance. The ups and downs, if you look at the change as we're going through the change, it's a lot of ups and downs. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. That's why we have to com consistently reinforce that. Most of the change in America is with chaos. There's no plan, no direction, got to have it by next quarter, and let's do it. And it's easy to sit there and say, this is what we need to be doing. But I'm asking you and putting it back on a how are you going to do it. And you're not going to do it alone. And you're not going to do it with just management. We have to build that throughout the organization. The resistance to change, the devil's advocate. This is what we're talking about. It's so disheartening in an organization. We get into this habit and we start talking about what's it going to do, how are we going to do it, and trying to defeat everything that comes up by looking at the negative side. What you see is that those habits become negative, and before you know it, everybody in the organization 
is picking up that what if the deal to death and that devil's advocate. And then what happens, whether we realize it or not, we're now doing that with our customers. We're now doing it at home. Remember, we'll remember seven negatives for we will every one positive. And what's interesting, when we get into the companies and we start some of this stuff, we got some guys that are going, hey, we just about got it. We just about ready to do that. Or we start talking about, the, oh, we're working on the forebear. Oh, training. Yeah, we just about got, oh, uh, the lack of communication. Well, that's improving. And what you'll see is when it comes down to making that decision, they'll go in a complete circle and say they don't have any issues. Then my question is, why in the world am I here? And what you'll see is that the change and the resistance, they will sit and justify every reason in the world not to do it. And it's because of fear. It's not that they have an arterial motive, but they're afraid of what's going to happen. And remember, it's just as easy to keep doing what you're doing than to change. Uh, Pin-up frustration in an organization and in change, there's a lot of pin-up frustration. So in changing, you're looking at being able to move that person, move that department, move that product, move that service, whatever you want to call it, and you're dealing with a lot of pent-up frustration because of the insecurity internally within the organization. So here it goes again. Here's another change. And like I said, we have a tendency, I don't care if the change is this big or this big, if we look at it, there's daily changes that are happening in your organization. And the bigger the change is, we're going, here's another one, here's another one that's not well thought out. So you have a lot of pent-up frustration. The quarter-to-quarter -quarter mentality when we're dealing with change and resistance to change is that if we're looking short-term, quarter-to-quarter -quarter mentality, we're slicing and cutting and we're not even looking long, we're not looking past the next quarterly report or uh, what we're more concerned with, and I'm not saying that we don't need to be concerned with, but what with our stock value, because I know that affects our credit, our line, and the whole bit. But if you look at this, we have to move to long-term thinking and planning out there. We have to look at it, move from quarter to quarter mentality. If you're looking at it, we keep fudging and moving the numbers around to meet those projections, and you can only increase and grow so long. Look at the companies out there that have been going 20 to 30 percent. Major companies we're all identified with. It gets to a point of saturation. Then they're going, hey, those guys have to learn how to... Make uh, basically do business. What we're saying is when you're growing at 30 percent you don't know where the real numbers are and just by sure growth you're now getting people excited and building that organization believe me when it flattens out you'll have problems and so now what happens then what do we do we'll go in and start closing stores we'll go in and start laying off people we'll go in and start cutting our advertising budget We'll start cutting our product, cutting our service, doing all this other stuff that we talk about that's uh, short-lived. We're looking at, we can do it ourselves. Now, this is an interesting thing here, is that when we get in and a company has been trying to do this stuff, as we get in and the decisions having to be made, they go, oh, well, we can do it ourselves. Not without a structured program, you can't. And the reason I think it's so hard to do it internally is because of the four barriers. It's really almost, even if you hire somebody to come in, keep them kind of parallel, whether it's the quality training director, the human resource, or whatever, that has control over the thing. Because if you look at it, trying to do it yourself with all the hidden stuff internally is almost impossible. Or we use that as a last line of defense. We don't need you. We can do it ourselves. Then my question is, how are you going to do it? Only need two barriers. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, we actually been to a company go, oh, we, we got the other ones covered. I said, by any chance, is it written procedure and training what you need? Oh, yeah, I got plenty of fear. We talked about this yesterday, and the guy sitting next with him almost choking. It was, it was, uh, don't need to beat that one anymore. Uh, you have to engage all four barriers because one short-lived without the other. We have no problems they do. What we're talking about there and in the change and things start going on, we have management going, I ain't got any problems. It's the guys I'm reporting to or the, or the guys that are reporting to me. And then the employee is going, I ain't got any problem. It's them. Everybody's pointing fingers at one another. And what we're saying is that my department's doing it fine. 
It's the other department's not doing good. So if you look at it, it's the other department, it's the other people, it's everything else, it's not me. Uh, the product of resistance to change, attacking the problem. We're saying the resistance of change, we have a tendency to attack each other. We're saying we've got to move and attack the problems and the issues because that, again, creates the fear. 1% manipulation. When we're looking at organizational change, this is the thing that's really damaging is that the 1% manipulation because they see the accountability starting to come up. What they like is an informal organization because the fact that they are not being held accountable for nothing and all they're doing is manipulate the organization and its employees to get whatever they want. And remember, the 1% manipulation that affect the other 4% that affect 20% of the organization. So when the change starts, they become the loudest. They're going to tell you every reason in the world why you don't need to change and every reason in the world why this change is we're losing every customer known to man. We're going to go out of business. What do you want me to do? Stop doing my work and doing training? or You're going to hear it. And remember, they're master manipulators. They do not have a problem lying to you. So Mr. CEO, President, uh, department head, you actually have 1% of your workforce that will come to you and they consistently are coming to you dropping these little half-truths that sound good and they know how to manipulate you. And they know how to manipulate their co-workers. And I guarantee you they're manipulating the folks at home. This 1% also has a ton of issues at home. So if you look at it, we're dealing with not only those insecurities of change, but their own interpersonal insecurities. Let's look in at sitting on the sidelines and the resistance to change. If there's not trust, I'm sitting on the sidelines and I'm going to tell you every reason why you have, you ain't, you can't, why every reason in the world what you should do other than I'm going to be involved. The sitting on the sidelines, I'm a great guy to sit there and tell you what you ought to do, but I'm not going to get involved and I'm going to tell you everything and that 1% is a master at this also. And the resistance to change is, is that I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait and let it play out because I don't trust the organization. And we have tried to do it before, but right now I'm not sure what we're going to do. And I'm not sure what the change is or where it's going to end up. The negative attitude. When we start having organizational change, the negative attitude starts coming because, in, in fact, we're getting frustrated. And the negative attitude is because of the fear. So no matter what you start throwing at it, it's going to have a negative attitude because of mainly of the fear and the resistance to fear in our past and what we're getting inundated with daily in the media. That creates now the change is anxiety, anger, and conflict. When we get into this and we start getting threatened personally, uh, whether it's insecurity of a job or where our departments are going to be or where the organization is going to be, all this stuff starts happening internally and it becomes almost self-defeating to us with this anxiety and anger. This is the sad thing that starts happening because not only do we start beating up one another, but we start taking this stuff at home. We start shutting down with our, our, uh, our spouse and then all of a sudden it creates conflict. <laughs> I know if you're married, none of y'all ever had any conflict with your spouse. Uh, hopefully some base skills will help you through that. Let's look at structural change. When we're looking at structural change internally within the organization, this is where the fear pops through the roof. Because what we're talking about structural change is looking at my job. Because I've been able to hold it right here. But when we start looking at my job, because of the lack of trust, because of the resistance to change, I start looking at it as the fact that you're coming in to attack me. You're coming in for some other reason other than for the benefit of me. You're coming in for the benefit of the organization at any expense, and that expense could be me. So crisis change. Man, this is the sad thing that's happening out there. Most of us do not change until we're bankrupt or close to bankrupt. Then it's hard to catch up. And what you'll see is that as the, the, we become contented and as that organization and we need to start changing is that we won't change. Is that we'll literally get all the way down to where we'll take on investors and pump money in. And I don't care what it is. I've seen it too many times. We'll pump money in. What we'll do won't change. We won't put it effectively. We'll kind of set back and before you know it, those investors that put in the cash are either now selling your organization or taking it over. 
And the reason for that is that most of us won't change until we are forced to change. We're saying let's build that infrastructure, let's build those base skills, let's build our employees and our organization for continuance and growth that when we do have to change, we're, we're changing with times, whether the times of product or service and with our employees instead of getting into a position where we're almost bankrupt. Change attitude. Change attitude from negative to positive. It's easy to sit and think of why this thing ain't going to work. We really need to look at changing our attitude to a positive. Interpersonal skills, because what's happening, we're dealing with a ton of insecurities, not only past, present, home life, work life, back life, school life, all this other stuff. But if you look at it, we're dealing with these inner insecurities that even make us resist change even that much more. Another great thing I keep hearing is that it won't work here. Ah, eh, Bruce, it worked over there, but it ain't going to work here. And I'm going, yes, it will work here. It's just as scary here. It's just as scary here as a, a company with 10 employees, 20 employees, 40 employees, as it is 100 and 1,000 plus employees. And believe me, I've heard it before. And the reason there are a lot of them saying that it won't uh, work here is the fact that they don't believe and don't have the support of management and they've tried other things and it ended up not working. And if you look at the change, most of the change is not managed, not monitored, and not held accountable. Remember, we talked about all these grand things we're going to do, but if we don't manage it, monitor it, and hold it accountable, and remember, most change in an organization is not well thought out and not planned. So what happens, that's where the chaos sets in. And we have to hold it accountable. Hey, here's an interesting one here. It says, uh, hostility directed at the change agent. I came across this. Somebody told me I was a change agent, or there's some dudes out there t calling themselves change agents, whether it's internally or externally within the organization. I tell you what, they're right. Because if you look at the frustration as, and the fear, they start... Uh, first of all, what we've learned is that we're saying don't attack each other. If you want to blame something, blame the four barriers to quality. Well, what we've seen is, is that sometimes just blaming the program or the four barriers ain't enough, but they got to blame a person. So I go, blame me. Blame me for all your misery in your life. And like I said, this is where the 1% the are champions. It's like they're starting little campfires throughout the organization. They're getting everybody to huddle around and they're telling us how all this stuff is going to kill all of us and how all this stuff's going to hurt us and how all this stuff ain't right and ain't safe and ain't this. But watch them. Those folks will never step up and get involved, and they never, and they don't give a hoot about you, and they don't give a hoot about your organization, and we never hold them accountable. we got to hold those guys accountable. Define those processes, and it'll help it. And if we were looking at existing way of doing business, if you're looking at trying to change, it's so much easier to keep doing how we've always done it the existing way of doing business. It's easier to do that. Even if the fact that we're getting ready to go out of business, it's easier to keep doing it than to change. And remember, we talk about that force change. Let's not let it get there. It, <sighs> change, too fast, too slow. I've heard it every way known to man. They're going, Bruce, you're too well defined. You're not defined enough. The change is too fast. It should be six months, not nah, two years. It should be three years. It should be five years. It should be three times a week, four times. I don't care what you do. Change is fear. We're saying just get started and just get it done because you're going to have opposite ex ends. Remember, we talked about the extreme on each side of the deal. And really, we're creating a lot of stress, and the stress is the unknown. We're not necessarily sure what's going to happen down the road. Uh, <laughs> we can't change because we don't have time. We'll do that bad boy next year. And I know what you'll be doing next year. You'll be in that strategic planning meeting and say, well, let's change this year. Hey, well, I thought that's what we were doing last year. You ain't got a plan to. You have to bring the whole organization on. And then you got this, this dude sitting in the back of the room going, hey, here we go again. I've seen and heard this. And, it's, and it's, we, we have some of this in the educational business. I've seen it, I've heard it, and they said, and it's recycling through. Here comes that old program again. It didn't work 30 years ago, but I'm the only one here that remembers. Here we go again. 
And in fact, we're addressing everything but the tough issues. The tough issues are holding accountable what we've agreed on. The tough issues are the four barriers to quality. And this 31 is what we call barrier picking. <laughs> barrier picking is, is going, oh, I only need one of those barriers, or I need two, or I need three. I'm saying that if you don't subscribe to improving and working on and breaking down those barriers of all four, is that nothing you're going to do, because we talked about that. How good is a written procedure when you have fear? We have tons of that in the news, and we'll continually have tons of that in the news that had all the procedures, were certified, but when they're fear, don't get brought up. So if you look at it, barrier picking, not involving the employees. A lot of the change we do or think about, we just come in and mandate it. What we've got to do is get the employees involved in the change to make them a part of it and let them, they, let them focus on their base work centers on what we've got to do. The reason we can't do that because they don't have the skills to do it. That's what we're talking about, the base skills. Everybody throughout the organization, including our management, middle, upper, lower, whatever you want to call it, supervisors, frontline supervisors, frontline workers, office workers, whatever, all have to have these base skills. If you're going to change an organization, you have to change everything in and every base work center, every process in there because you make one change affects, us all, affects all of them. Remember, for every process and step change, there's a people change, and that's what creating fear. So we talked a lot about what this organizational change looked like and the resistance to change. What we want to do now is look at how do we address the resistance to change. And this is where we're saying a lot of this stuff and a lot of these things out there is where it kind of stops. It tells you everything what, what's wrong with the company. It's like hiring those consultants to come in and they give you a big line and they cha charge all that money and then they're going, hey, this is what's wrong with your company or this is your whatever you got to do and they're gone. And the, the guy that's paid for it and go, well, I knew these problems. I want to know how to fix it. So what we're going to do is follow through and tell you what we've got to do in order to fix it. How do we address the resistance to change? We have to really start looking at and working through the four barriers to quality and the profit uh, of change. And I'm sorry, the profile of change. What we talked about are all these things that are having to have leadership. We're having to have concession to change. And what we're saying, the consistency promotes truth, that promotes trust. That's what we're talking about is change. We have to have patience, faith, and trust. Well, how are you going to get all that? We have to work on inner strength. We have to work on consistency. And we have to work on faith, if nothing else, that what we're doing is right. And we have to trust not only ourselves, our coworker, and our organization. Let's focus on the 99%. Let's focus on the 99% of the employees that are doing it right. Stop listening and giving a deaf ear to that, or giving that ear to that 1%. Because that 1% is manipulating you day and night, and probably the good employees, y'all driving them off in groves. And what we're saying is stay focused on our 99%. Step back and look at who that guy is always bringing the misery to the organization. They're also the ones that are never helping the organization. But they're the first one to say, I thought you ought to know this. The change is going to take 8 to 14 months. We have to, it's 8 to 14 months before we just start believing that in the change and believing and trusting. So it ain't going to happen. Remember the affirmation story we talked about. 18 to 24 months, they're going to halfway start taking ownership. So this is really reinforcing how in the world are you going to change in a quarter? You ain't. You, you might be able to sit in there and tell you and beat your chest that you're doing it, but it ain't, and your employees are all shaking their head, business as usual. Remember the funnel concept. This is really important. As we're starting to develop the base work centers and the base skills, the funnel concept is, is that once they know the organization is going to hold accountable what we've agreed on, the funnel concept starting with the 20% start funneling down to where they're jumping on board and the 1% will funnel out. Every organization we've ever gone to, we have lost 1%. And that is, is the fact we've never fired them, they just left. Because they're being held accountable, not by management, but by their coworkers that have been frustrated with them for years. 
And most of the change in the stuff that we're doing and the skills we need to develop is, is that it, we're half the time dealing with issues that are not on the table. If you look at that, we have to develop those base skills and those understanding of why these things are happening, not only with our process, but with our people. And if you look at most of the time what we're talking about and dealing with the change, they're saying this is the reason we're not changing. What we're saying is get awareness of why they are resisting. And that is mainly the fear and the four barriers and the lack of trust, and we get in that loop again. What we're saying here is moderation and balance. The change has to be moderate and balanced. And again, what we're saying is, is that we can't go in and slash prices over here or slash uh, payroll or to do this or that in this one department. And we have to do it across the organization. We're saying, yeah, that guy's expenses are out of, out of whack. Let's cut that 15%. Our first question should be, number one, why is it out of whack? Number two is, how can we help them fix it? Let's look at all participate. In the organization, how do we address it? Everybody in the organization has to participate from the top guy all the way down to the bottom. And we have to hold it accountable. If you look at holding accountable, that's the tough decision. You're going to hear it a gazillion other times here. We have to manage and monitor this thing. If we put it into play, we have to manage and monitor it. We also have to learn as we develop our base skills, deal with personalities. The process stuff is easy. We have to deal with the personalities. And the program has to be held accountable. If we've agreed on however and whatever we're going to do, we have to have the freedom and the trust internally to hold that thing accountable. And it says uh, quality issue. Remember what a quality issue is. A quality issue is in conflict of the two rules. We have to address those. Uh, the, basically, that is, is do what's morally and ethically correct and treat everybody as you want to be treated. Let's use some people math. Change an A negative to an A positive. It's just as easy to have a good day and to be positive as it is negative. So believe me, if we focus on it, we can do it. So it's just as easy to change. Uh, uh, to have, but we have to change our mindset and we have to change the way that we're thinking and doing. Let's look at the results of breaking through the four barriers, what we're talking about all this stuff here. Holding accountable the four barriers, which is fear, lack of communication, lack of written procedure, and lack of training, and also dealing with the organizational change. We become a proactive organization. We talked about how fear is paralyzing the organization. When we don't have the base skills internally throughout the organization, is that what's happening, uh, we are reactive. So um, working on our base skills and the four barriers, we now are and becoming a proactive organization. And looking at attacking the issues, not the people. Again, this is some of the skill and base skill training and awareness of what we're talking about is that attacking the issue and not the people. Remember, when you find yourself sitting in there in that meeting and we start attacking people or making wisecracks, oh, oh that's so-and-so. We have to look at, take it away from that and let's focus on the issues and not our people. And remember, if you want to blame something or somebody, blame the four barriers to quality. In this, as we grow through these four barriers, we become secure with ourselves. And, and it's amazing what happens by feeling good about going to work and knowing long term you've got a job. And we're saying like, well, if they think they got a job forever, they're not going to, oh man, our people are going to do what's right. There's a gazillion other companies down the road from you that are doing it right. Go out and look at them. And most of those folks there invest heavily in their people. Uh, we become secure with the organization. We're not going to become secure with ourselves until we become secure with our organization at work. When we're doing that, we're feeling better about ourselves. And believe me, we become a little better uh, mommy or daddy or spouse. If you look at a formal organization, as we're working through the four bears, we become a formal organization. We have people improvement, awareness of oneself, of work, and at home, because all these skills that we're talking about, even here today, we've talked about all these skills are transformable, are transferable, not only at work, but at home from one department to the next. We're looking at working with the positive attitude. We retain the integrity of the organization of people and process. We're building business infrastructure for what we call continuance and growth. 
This is the things that we're talking about here. All right, let's go now to page number 13, the two rules. We're going to look at the two rules. The two rules are do what's morally and ethically correct and treat everybody as you want to be treated. If you look at with the rules, we have to hold everybody accountable. If you look at that, we have to hold one another accountable in regards to these rules. The life lesson, again, the two rules, do what's morally and ethically correct and treat everybody as you want to be treated. Let's look at the tough decisions. We've talked about this a gazillion times, and this is what tough decisions are. The tough decisions, we, how do you do this? How do you get that organization to make the, we have to have a checklist for success, we have to have the business uh, hearing to the base values, and at the bottom line of the checklist, we say the organization has to make tough decisions. And the tough decision is holding somebody accountable. So when we're saying tough decisions, we mean tough decisions. Tough decisions are holding accountable what we've agreed on. I don't care if it's my brother-in-law. I don't care if it's my uh, co-worker. I don't care if it's the boss. Because like I told you, that one company we had, they set a record of not only quality issues, but they started earlier than anyone, and they were writing them on the owner of the company, which showed us there was no fear internally. So if you look at it, it all, uh, if the other guy doesn't have to do it, then why should I? And the tough decisions are holding it accountable throughout the organization. If you look at when dealing with tough decisions, deal only with data and not emotion. This is some of the stuff we're talking about here. Next, let's go to page number 15. And page number 15, we're looking at how to address personal conflict. A personal quality issue occurs when they are in conflict of either our base values or our two rules. If an employee feels that it's a problem, we must address it regardless of, the, of our own personal opinion. If our employee says it's a problem, it's a problem. We encourage each of us to look at it from the other person's standpoint. Many people just don't do things that they say or believe in, so we're saying here, just do what's right. The focus of addressing a quality issue is not pinning the blame, that's the life lesson, but in coming to an agreement on the solution. Okay, so we covered a lot of stuff here. We want to keep looking at what these four barriers are, and I'd like for you to look at the frequently asked questions and our thoughts. What is a hit and miss training? A hit and a miss training is no formalized training program. Sometimes we we work on this, sometimes we work on this, it's not consistent throughout the organization. What, what, set a training schedule? Yes, we have to set a training schedule. We want to set a training schedule a, a year in advance. And it says, why set a training a year in advance? Because in effect, that starts setting discipline throughout the organization. By setting that training, then we can start tracking, managing, and monitoring it. How long do we train? We never stop training. It's continual. We continually will change our business and have more employees coming in. What do you mean by universities of tomorrow? We can get all these folks coming into our organization that don't have skills and we can complain about it all day long. But what we're saying is, is that the best place for them to get these skills and skills development is at the organization. We're saying learn through doing. Most of us only learn through doing. Yeah, we can get all this stuff talked about until we actually get in and get our hands dirty. That's it. Why is, it, why is change tough? Change is fear. Why should corporate set the tone for change? Because we don't trust and we're not going to do it if our boss ain't doing it and we're not going to believe until we see management and the organizational corporate leading the change. Change causes fear. You darn right it does. Because anything changing is fear. Review the 1% manipulation. Remember the 1%? They're totally manipulating the organization. Have to have patience, faith, and trust. What is an awareness center? Awareness center is how we're teaching and training our organization and our employees. What we're doing here, we're finishing up. I want you to think about all four barriers and look forward to seeing y'all in some of our other classes and stuff. But remember what we talk about these four barriers to quality, and your people are good. Thank you.